I'm gonna do this poem, it's called Charlene Allows, and um, I think it's self-explanatory, but thank you to the staff so much for putting this on. Um, say her name, Charlene Allows. I hear you, thank you. Lena is what we called her. Her smile was bright like the sun. I remember back in the day, our grandmother used to call us heifers. We get kicked outside and off we went like hot peppers. We were making an adventure out of anything. You were always willing to give your everything, yet I never imagined you would have to give your very life. That you would be a part of the police vice 911, quick, it's an emergency. I think it's a burglary. Can you imagine calling for help and when your help arrived, you were sentenced to your very death? See, my cousin was shot dead in her home, no chance to survive as she probably struggled to take her last breath, fighting not to leave her four children behind. And did I mention she was three months pregnant and three was also the number of children that witnessed the police's misconception? See, she took bullets to her back, stomach, and chest. She was 100 pounds and yet the police called her a threat and what's going on? What's going on? We were in church when we received the call. She was shot. Two officers, one woman, how could this be? I instantly felt as if I was living in 1963 and let's make America great again by eliminating its indigenous people that are the majority. Do you really see the minorities? Money is power, people. We talk about equality, but we aren't treated equal. And no. My target isn't white people. This is a battle of good versus evil, light against darkness, love and hate. Wait, I think the system hit a home run. Batter up, they pulled the trigger. This isn't a game. I hope they didn't just see my cousin as just another nigga. Go figure. We can't run, nor can we hide. Death will come seek us in our bodies. It will find. If you ever feared your life, you will be able to understand. We have to stand up to the system. We have to make a plan. I'm tired of watching CNN as black bodies dead seem to be the latest trend. A trend set many years ago now being publicized. Private institutions invested in unions committed to oppression. Let's dissect the root of racism's conception. All we are asking for is justice. Charlene allows a mother gun as we give another tally to senseless death. And if you want us to breathe, then do me a favor and stop making us hold our very breath. So let's say her name, Charlena Lows. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Katrina Johnson. And I just want to come to you tonight to offer a perspective from the family. Not the one that you hear or see on the news or in the media. For our family, on June 18th, 2017, our family member was gunned down in her home in front of three of her four children when she called the police for help to report a burglary. And that's all we knew. And, and from that day, trying to figure out what's true and what's not has been hard enough within itself because you have to face the police putting out a narrative that dehumanizes and criminalizes your loved one before any investigation even starts. And so it all automatically puts the family on the defense. We are out here trying to grieve and we are not able to do that because we have to fight. We have to fight to, to clear her name. We have to fight because she's not that person that's crazy as the media would have you. She was a mom who loved her kids and who doesn't have issues. I have issues. Everybody has issues, but it shouldn't, you should not be condemned to your death because you have issues. There isn't a person out here that doesn't have issues. So then you're, you're trying to go up against a system that is designed to keep people oppressed. And within that, you're trying to seek justice, but there is no justice in that system unless the whole system is dismantled and rebuilt. For my family, 
we, when I went to the deputy prosecuting attorney's office before the investigation was even complete, they told us that no officer would be charged with my cousin's killing. And I, I'm thinking to myself, how can that be? You don't even have all the evidence. You haven't even gathered everything in. It doesn't matter. It, they have already come to a conclusion because they're investigating themselves. So why would we get any justice out of a system that is investigating itself? And so for us, and for me personally, I realize the only way that I am going to get justice is to fight and to fight for policy changes, police reform. And so I got behind initiative I-940 for police accountability because without accountability, you have nothing. They will continue to kill our loved ones and blood will continue to be spilled in the streets unless we all get together. Even though it's not happening in your community right now, you are not immune to it coming to your community. It's not a white thing, it's not a black thing, it's, it's everybody. Anybody is subject to be killed by the police, whether, whether woman, child, black, or white, because they do not have accountability. And until we decide that we want accountability for everybody, whether you be black or brown or white, then there'll be accountability for nobody. And so my thing is, we have to go within our communities and begin to educate people, and we have to demand change. If, you're, if your law enforcement isn't doing what you need them to do, well, I guess you better vote for a better mayor. You have to vote for change. You cannot sit there and be upset and be disenfranchised, but do nothing about it. You have to want change. You have to vote. You have to let your voice be, uh, be heard. Lend your voice to the movement, even though it's not your family member. Because the reality is, if nothing changes, it could be your family member next. And this is not a group that you want to be a member of, because the cost is too high. Now, I know you have plenty of questions, um, but let's try to hold them to the end. Um, and uh, let's hear from Jose, um, Jorge. Thank you. Uh, I guess I first want to acknowledge that um, my experience, no matter how traumatic or um, belittling or uh, just disempowering it was, it definitely is not in the same type of scenario at all as it is to lose a family member. Um, and just the, the immeasurable loss around that an institution that exists without accountability. And I, what I think might be an unabiding anger and rage at that injustice that exists. Um, you know, my experience, I think, might be useful uh, to this panel insofar as it, it points to or, or it shows the, the lengths that um, departments like the Seattle Police Department, but police departments around the country all, all go through to be able to stop dissent and protest and keep things as they are, and, and how toxic the environment is in those workplaces uh, in police departments. Um, on December 6, 2014, uh, I attended a rally in March that was organized by Women of Color for Systemic Change. Um, they, they organized the demonstration because back to back we had heard that grand juries refused to, uh, refused to, to indict uh, the murderers uh, who, who killed Mike Brown and Eric Garner and across the country, people just were outraged and took to the streets, and in, in Seattle was no different. Um, after the demonstration, there were a number of people who still wanted to voice their frustration and still wanted to march and show the city uh, what it felt like to, to experience this injustice and to see it. Um, 
and we continued our march throughout the city, uh, throughout downtown. The police kept kept picking us off one by one throughout the hour that we were marching into the early afternoon, uh, arresting in, in all six people over the course of the march, and I was uh, one of the last ones. Um, as, as it was said earlier, uh, after my arrest, uh, it was found through discovery uh, from uh, my lawyers that the, the one of the officers who had been describing me uh, talked about how they could put certain types of charges against me to be able to justify uh, taking me down and stopping the demonstration. Um, and then also, um, as was heard on the dash cam, which you can, you can find online, it says, uh, the officer said, just get that fucking uh, web back. And uh, the, it was with the help of uh, Patricia Sully and the Public Defenders Association um, over the course of months that the, the, the city finally dropped their charges. Um, it was really outrageous. Uh, we, we found the, the report, my arrest report, where the, office, the arresting officer, Burns, uh, describes uh, the, the day wholly just unprofessionally uh, a lot of uh, subjectivity a lot of irrelevant information uh, sometimes just fabrications about what happened and what was said um, but he, he used it all to justify my arrest and to justify the three recommendations of charges uh, which, which they, they, they gave me which was pedestrian interference reckless endangerment and inciting a riot uh, <laughs> which the city of Seattle realized that was a little too outlandish and they dropped pretty quickly. Um, but it took a few months for, for it all to finally be, uh, be put away. Um, afterwards, James Bible and the James Bible Law Group uh, approached me. Uh, they've been doing fantastic work over the years and they said that this should not just be let go. I was, I was ready to just accept it as something that just happens um, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, something that's just, Far for the course, but folks around me really encouraged me to say, take this on, push back against this, put this on record, let it be known, make sure they take notice. Um, and I'm grateful that they did because it's been uh, a really, a really, I think, re-empowering experience to be able to know that that there are people around me who support this kind of work that we do, uh, who know that we need to be able to hold departments accountable. I think um, one of the things that's really striking to me that we were talking about before the panel was just how willingly and, and ably the, the officers uh, talked uh, on their dash cam, both about me, but also about um, other individuals too. Um, about Native Americans and, ta and saying completely disparaging things about them, about protesters in general. You think about the type of workplace, and think about it, what your workplace would be like if that was just a common occurrence where people just felt like that's just something you can do. Um, it's, it's just completely, it's, it's completely a, a, a horrific, um, especially when you think about the fact that these departments and institutions promote themselves as being there to support the population. It's completely not the case at all. Um, I think that there's a wholesale unaccountability and they know it. They know that they're not accountable and, and it just, the type of environment that it takes to be able to have just flagrant racism, uh, supporting the status quo and propping it up and maintaining it. They're not there to make things better. They're there to keep things as they are. Uh, and I think that creates all sorts of really really just oppressive ideas that, that we all have to face because of it. I think that there's, uh, I think there's a long ways to go for, for demanding real accountability, um, but I'm excited that there's so many people here at this panel tonight because it will take, it will take all of us organizing for the long term, for the long fight, and fighting together. We can win a much better world than we have now. Um, and I'm grateful that this panel is here uh, and that this event is taking place because we can win.
Thank you very much, Jose. Um, Jorge, I, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> uh, and now Jesse Hokopian, who has the distinction of having been pepper sprayed by the uh, Seattle Police Department. Well, thank you, Jorge. And, and first, I just want to say condolences to the members of um, Charlena Lyles' family here. Um, I know as the one-year anniversary approaches, it just gets harder to deal with the trauma. And um, just know that you have a community here that supports you all and, and will do what we can to lift you up uh, as this um, event gets near. And I think we just need to say it plainly that we have a system of Jim Crow, or we could call it the new Jim Crow policing here in Seattle and around the country, right? Yep. This is a system that's brutalizing black and brown and native people, men and women. And I think that uh, you can tell that from looking at the statistics when you see 412 people have been killed already this year by police, right? Almost a thousand people killed last year alone in the United States by, by police officers. And our society has a tendency to individualize problems that are in fact systemic, right? So whenever I raise these issues, someone comes forward and says, well, not all cops are bad, Jesse, right? That's not the point. That's not the, the question that we're, we're talking about. Of course not every police officer has malice in their heart and wants to uh, slaughter black and brown and native people, right? <laughs> Some of them, I mean, we have uh, people who are uh, realizing the systemic nature of the police and wanting to do something about it. But the problem is the system of policing it is organized around brutality, right? It's organized around keeping black and brown and native uh, and poor and working class people in line at all costs. And my, my experience with the Seattle Police Department illustrates that. We don't have to philosophize about it. Let's just look step by step at what happened. So I'm on the phone on Martin Luther King Day 2015, standing on the sidewalk, uh, at the end of a, a demonstration for Martin Luther King Day, and a police officer assaults me with pepper spray directly in the face and the eyes and the ears. Uh, as I'm on the phone trying to coordinate with my mom a ride to my two-year-old son's birthday party. Okay. Now that assault was bad enough, but if it was just a problem of individual police, then we could handle that and deal with that. The problem was that the Office of Professional Accountability made the bold recommendation of a one-day suspension without pay. What would happen if I had assaulted her? You wouldn't be seeing me right now. I would still be behind bars, right? But for her, accountability in this city means a one-day suspension without pay? Actually, it doesn't. Because the chief of police, Kathleen O'Toole, intervened in my case to make sure that that uh, harsh penalty wasn't carried through. She said that is far too much discipline and erased that from happening. Now, if I hadn't had the incident captured on film, there, there would have been no outcome for me at all. But uh, thankfully, somebody caught it on video. And because of that, we were able to reach a settlement. But let me tell you this. A settlement is not justice. A settlement is not accountability. Mm -hmm. I'm proud to say that I was able to use that settlement, though, to start the Black Education Matters Student Activist Award. And now, every year, I give away $1,000 to deserving youth who are fighting against the school-to-prison pipeline, against police brutality, and for racial justice in this city. But let me just say, while my case uh, receives some attention in this city and, and around the country, too often uh, there's so many cases that don't receive any attention, and it especially happens when we're talking about uh, women who are the victims of police brutality, right? And we need to understand that, and that's why I jumped into organizing and supporting the case of Charlena Lyles and, and fighting for justice. And that's why the night she was killed, I, I went and reached out to the family to meet you all to see what we could do to help. 
And what the first thing I thought we could do was this. Earlier that year, we'd had an event in the schools called Black Lives Matter at school, and we had gotten 3,000 shirts that said Black Lives Matter, hashtag say her name to the teachers of the Seattle Public Schools. And what we did is in, in two days of Charlena's murder by the police, we were able to get hundreds of teachers to come back to school wearing those shirts in solidarity with Charlena Lyles, which is one of the things I'm most proud of ever having been a part of. Because when you read those despicable, disparaging remarks about her in the newspaper, trying to dehumanize her, trying to say she is outside uh, of our community, that she's not worthy of our love and our respect, right? This changed the narrative. Now they had to talk about her as a mother of kids in the Seattle public schools, and the teachers in Seattle were reaching out and embracing her as part of the community. But too many women don't get recognized for, what, for, for the brutality they experience. And we should remember the names of Jacqueline Slayers, a pregnant mother who was shot to death by Tacoma police officers on January 28th, 2016. We should remember before her the name of Renee Davis, a 23-year-old pregnant mother who was a Native American woman who was five months pregnant and killed by two King County Sheriff's Office on officers in the Muckleshoot Indian Reservation. We should remember the name of Malika Brooks. I just learned about her a couple weeks ago. She's a 33-year-old pregnant woman, and she was driving her 11-year-old kid to school um, in Seattle in a November morning when a police officer stopped her, gave her a ticket, and told her to sign the ticket. Well, she didn't want to sign the ticket because she thought that would be an admission of guilt. So the officer deemed her combative like they did to Sandra Bland. And this officer tased her several times, her pregnant body lurching so hard she fell out of the car, right? Um, and I, I just want to recommend to everybody that you read this book, Invisible No More. It's called Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color that traces the history of this police violence from, from slavery through Jim Crow till today uh, against um, black and brown bodies that, that too often go unnoticed. And I just want to end by saying that these experiences show that I wasn't just assaulted by a specific officer. And these women weren't just assaulted by a specific officer. They were assaulted by an, a system of policing that is completely out of control. And we need to, uh, I think, uh, as, Christina, uh, as Katrina said, we need a complete uh, dismantling of this system. And I think an immediate uh, fight that we need to look at is a total disarming of the police department to stop this, this what's really mass murder of communities of color in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jesse. And uh, now we have someone from the belly of the beast. Uh, <laughs> Norm Stamper. Thank you, I think. I was asked to talk about why we see so much police violence, uh, particularly why white police officers uh, all too often shoot and kill unarmed uh, people of color, young people, poor people, people of color. Um, and a little bit later, we're going to shift gears, I'm sure, and start talking about what we can do about these things. We must have that conversation. But I couldn't uh, uh, agree more that what we're looking at is a profound systemic challenge uh, in, in reforming police uh, or abolishing police, issues that, that deserve consideration, conversation. But I think there are a, a, a small number of reasons that most of us can agree uh, help to explain why we see so much of this. At the top of my list is that there are too many police officers of all colors, but principally white, who do not place sufficient value on the sanctity of human life. They simply do not. And that they have been taught and told 
this is the way to be. You see somebody with a knife, you see somebody who may have a gun, you see somebody who you think is a threat to you that will keep you from going home at the end of your shift to your family and your loved ones, then you better take action or you won't be here for that to happen. So we wind up, I think, with a situation in which, number one, too many officers do not place the protection and preservation of human life as their number one priority. Talked to a cop a couple of months ago and he said, Chief, I have a mantra. Every time I hit the streets, I tell myself, nobody dies tonight. Nobody dies tonight. I don't, I'm gonna make it home to my family, but every single person I encounter is gonna survive that encounter. It's a mentality, it's an attitude. It doesn't suggest weakness, on the contrary, it suggests real strength, of, uh, certainly of character. And I did say, and wanna repeat, that police officers are doing what they've been taught to do. Here's one problem. We think of teaching or instruction or training as taking place in the academy, and certainly it does. And much improvement is needed there generally across the board throughout the country. But the most powerful training does not take place in a classroom. It takes place in the front seat of a police car or in the locker room where a senior cop tells a junior cop, this is how we do it in this city. And that gets to the culture, which is a function of the system, a function of the paramilitary bureaucratic structure of American law enforcement, which we have to acknowledge comes from a very tainted history. From the very beginning, police in our society have been aligned with tainted ideologies, have been aligned with a belief that there are inferior people, that there are criminals, that there are mentally ill people, that there are people who don't look like me, or perhaps talk like me, or dress like me. And so we wind up with this, this situation in which police officers are viewing the community as the enemy. You don't fight a war without an enemy. You don't fight a war without propaganda. And as we know all too painfully, you don't fight a war without weapons. Uh, weapons of destruction, weapons that, that take lives. There's another issue that must be addressed and it must be addressed with all the courage and the political will that we muster. And that is we cannot afford scared cops. Frightened cops are impulsive cops. They literally don't see straight. Fear does that to us. It affects our perception. And then it affects our judgment. And so we get an awful lot of horrific situations that are the direct result of unmanaged fear on the part of police officers. Combine that with these other factors and you've got a real problem. A police officer who believes that anybody who happens to be holding a knife is a lethal threat uh, to his or her personal safety. So I think it's vital that we understand that scared cops are dangerous cops. Fear is not a socially acceptable emotion in the cop culture. So there's a lot of compensating going on. There are a lot of police officers talking tougher than they genuinely feel. A lot of police officers using horrific language to talk to their fellow citizens because they're really afraid of their fellow citizens. And they think that by screaming at them, yelling at them, a la Philando uh, uh, Castillo in, in, in Minnesota, or Laquan McDonald in Chicago, or Walter Scott in North Charleston, South, South Carolina, just screaming at people and eventually using lethal force where no force whatsoever is justified. Two of those that I mentioned in my estimation, my frame of reference, were cold-blooded murders on the part of people that wore the uniform that I used to wear. It's important, I think, that we all understand one fundamental tenet of, of policing as it should be before we get into our, our prescriptions. Uh, 
And that is that the police in America belong to the people, not the other way around. And too many officers convey this attitude in many of their contacts. We're the cops and you're not. And that attitude, that mentality is destructive to everyone, including those people who, who wear those uniforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norm. And now we'll hear from Alex Vitelli, um, the East Coast. Thank you. And I want to say uh, that I'm just thrilled to be here in Seattle and have some, some friends in the audience. It's my first time out here. And uh, super appreciation to the Red May folks who facilitated my uh, being here. So it's very inspiring to hear the fight back, but it's also you know, very moving, the reason that we have to be here. And we should always keep that balance in mind. And when I think about the fight back, and I, and I see the fight back hip, happening here and all across the country, I'm traveling all across the country, and I've been doing this work for, for almost 30 years, and I've seen a lot of cycles of egregious police abuse, community mobilization, some reforms, demobilization, and then more police abuse, and the cycle continues, and we don't always do a very good job of breaking out it. So we've got to ask some tough questions about what do we mean by police reform? Yeah, we want to see police officers held accountable, but what does that mean? What would that really look like? Everyone was so excited when the DA in Baltimore indicted those officers. We're going to get some justice. Did we get any justice? Did any police officers go to jail? Did policing in Baltimore change in any meaningful way? No, it did not. No, it did not. In New York, when Amadou Diallo was killed in the vestibule of his building for pulling out his wallet when the cops ran up to him in the middle of the night, massive mobilization, huge direct action campaign, shut down police headquarters for weeks. What was the demand? Indict the officers. They were indicted, found not guilty, nothing changed. The movement was demobilized. These weren't real reforms, and they're not going to be possible because they misunderstand the nature of policing. Policing is not the kind of institution that can be fixed by putting a few police officers on trial. First of all, the system is designed not to hold them accountable. The legal systems are created to allow exactly these behaviors. And in the very rare occasion when an officer is caught acting in such an egregious fashion that they are the exception, they become the exception that proves the rule in the sense that the whole institution jettisons them and says, well, that has nothing to do with what we do, and therefore it's no real reflection on us, and therefore there's nothing really that we have to change except to get rid of that one officer. What about the nature of policing itself? Don't, can't we just fix policing with some community policing, some de-escalation training, put some body cameras on, have some implicit bias training? That's my favorite. Implicit bias training. This is the idea that people have these unconscious biases that we can measure through, so, uh, through uh, laboratory psychological testing and we put people in front of monitors with little buttons and we get these little micro millisecond differences and that if we could just train officers to be aware of their unconscious, unintentional bias, that this would help end the killing of unarmed black people. But of course, as Jorge pointed out, we don't have a problem of implicit bias. We have a problem of flagrant racism. <laughs> now, this is not... So, so that when we look for racism in American policing, we sure find it. 
when we see the emails, when we get access to the chat rooms, right, when we find the white supremacist tattoos underneath the uniforms, that stuff is all out there and there's nothing implicit about it. But this does not mean that all police officers have to be thought of as racist individuals, because that's just clearly not true. I've spent a career working with police officers, and it's just not true. And, and in a place like New York, a majority of police officers are non-white. In Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, in Detroit, in Philadelphia. But no one's holding up those police departments as models of perfect policing with no problems of racialized policing because it's not about just the bias of an individual police officer. It's about the fundamental mission that we've given the police. Implicit bias is the perfect liberal solution to the problems of policing because it allows politicians to say they're doing something about the race problem in a way that no one is responsible for. It was all a big misunderstanding. I know you didn't mean it. It was an accident. And we're just, could you please not kill any more black people and we'll all be much happier. Thank you very much. No, the problems of racism are about the mission we've given police, a totally professional, unbiased, community-driven, low-level drug arrest is still going to ruin someone's life for no damn good reason. We've had a war on drugs for 40 years. Drugs are cheaper, easier to get, and of more, greater potency than they've ever been. The war on drugs has never had anything to do with public health or public safety. It's about a cynical, toxic politics of race, the mobilization of white fear and resentment through the lens of a moralistic crusade around drugs that just drives overdoses, death, mass criminalization. So if we want to do something about the problems of policing, we need to quit tinkering with technocratic fixes like body cameras, and we need to ask why we've turned every problem in our communities over to the police to solve, or perhaps more importantly, why we've allowed our elected officials to frame every problem in our communities as a problem that can only be solved by policing. That's the real issue. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, our next speaker, um, he's a professor as well, but he has something in common with Jesse and Jorge. He's had some direct one-on-one -on -one encounters with cops, and uh, perhaps uh, David will tell us about that. Or not. I mean, I think everyone, probably half the people on this panel have been, maybe except for Norm, thrown down on the ground by a cop. <laughs> so I've had that happen to me. But anyways, first of all, I want to just thank uh, the folks, the Red May organizers, um, for bringing us together with this panel. And I want to um, offer my condolences to the family of Charlena Lyles. Um, I got involved directly not just as a professor or a writer about this, but as an activist in Albuquerque in 2004, when just months before Ferguson police killed James, uh, killed uh, Mike Brown, Albuquerque police killed James Boyd. And, and the book that I just recently co-wrote with Tyler Wall, Police, a Field Guide, you know, I made, made certain that we released it on the fourth anniversary of James Boyd's murder. And, and I was involved as an activist, but I was also trying to focus specifically on the fear I had in the wake of the murder of James Boyd by Albuquerque police, that the forces of police reform were, go were going to form in Albuquerque and uh, really eradicate a, a growing movement in Albuquerque that was confronting police directly. And, and so I was writing articles in the local press and I was trying to remind people, you know, between 1987 and 1997, Albuquerque police killed more people per capita than any department in the United States. And then the outrage produced all these reform measures, like an absolutely brand new police oversight commission that was unlike any other in the United States. Um, they raised training and hiring standards. And then the police uh, promptly killed 23 people in the next three years. 
so increased the amount of people that they were killing. Um, and, you know, and, I, and so I was writing and I was talking facts. I was saying, you know, look, in, in, in 2014, the Albuquerque Police Department committed 21% of all homicides in the city of Albuquerque. Um, and, I, and I pointed out that, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter, all these reform measures uh, that we were enacting didn't make a difference. As Alex was saying, we've had generations of efforts to reform police. Um, and, and, and then I started to think, what, what, what is it exactly that makes police reform so compelling as an option when all empirical evidence demonstrates that it doesn't actually transform police? And so I started to pay attention to the rhetoric, the, the way that police talk, and the way that we, including activists uh, or professors, talk about police. Um, and I realized a couple things, and I think these are important. It's what my book, Police, A Field Guide, tries to get at. Um, and there's three things that I want to mention in the time I have. One is that we are offered no alternative to police. Every single person in this room has probably been at a point in your life when you've been in trouble, when you've feared for your life or your safety or your loved one's safety. And who do you have to turn for help? What institution, uh, institutions do we have in our communities that are alternatives to police? We don't have, most of the time, we don't have those institutions. Secondly, we're raised, I mean, listen, Officer Friendly is not just a joke, right? That's an actual program the Chicago Police Department created to put, to, I mean, probably half the people in this room were read to in school by cops, right? Or you went to coffee with a cop, or you were at the state fair and a cop gave your kids stickers, right? Um, we dare is another example. Um, police are, 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 we're told as a, from a very young age that police are the thin blue line. And this is a real, this is a metaphor that police themselves really hold dear to, right? And it's an important one. What is the thin blue line, right? It is police and it is a line between civilization and savagery. And, and, and it is police that literally is this line. It is a metaphor, but for police it's not a metaphor. And it's thin. It is a thin line, right? Police are always under attack. They're always confronting threats. Everything is an emergency. This is how police tell their story to your children. But you know what? The most important thing, and this is the third one I'm going to talk about, is that we have no language to talk about police that isn't given to us by police. Police don't just patrol our streets, they patrol the language we have to talk about cops. Every single one of us in here has a cop in our head, right, that, that we have to fight against, that wants to see every person as a possible threat, that wants to conceive of every possible circumstance as, a, as an emergency, right? And, and it, so it's a language that, that law endorses and that explains situations that we've talked about on this panel. Why don't that cop, why doesn't that cop get arrested? Why don't they get fired from the force? Um, because that cop is the only cop capable of, uh, of identifying who's a threat, what's a threat, what is an emergency. They have the discretion to make all of those decisions. It doesn't matter if you have a weapon. If the cop thinks you have a weapon, that's the lawful decision by the cop. So, what do we do then? Because if we, if we are using the language that cops give us to talk about alternatives to cops, the road leads us to more cops. It's not an accident that every police reform process in every city I've ever looked at results in more cops. More cops, more weapons, more equipment, more cops. Why is that? Because we don't have that language. And so we need to start our own language. And, and so the book attempts to pull back the curtain and explain to you, what does discretion really mean? How, how, um, what, what is, uh, what is a uh, uh, body cavity search, if not state rape, yeah. right? What, is, um, what, what do cops think me justified means? What does unarmed mean when a cop says it? Right? And, and how might we actually redefine these, these words and these concepts in a way that gives us collectively a language to talk about real alternatives to policing that have nothing to do about police reform? Because police reform is not about cops. Police reform is about you, right? Police reform is an effort to restore legitimacy in police in times of crisis, and you are the problem. 
because you don't trust the cops. It's your lack of faith in police that constitutes the crisis for police. And police reform is the solution to your lack of faith in police. So when we talk about police reform, we're talking in a language that serves the interest of the institution that guarantees the inequality and racism we've been talking about today on this panel. That's what police reform is about. Thank you, David. And uh, now, um, Michelle, ACLU. Thank you. Um, and I'm really humbled to be here on this panel where there is so much experience and so much knowledge and also want to acknowledge um, the Charlena Lyles family and actually all those who have been impacted by police violence. What I thought I would do with my time is talk a little bit about some of the things that we keep seeing as uh, the problems that arise behind the police violence that takes place. Um, touch on a few of the statistics in Washington State and what some of the efforts have been to make change around how policing is happening here. Um, and then mention a little bit about oversight if I don't run out, if I don't get like that 30 second sign up uh, by the time I get there. So there, there are three big things that just keep showing up every time we look at these incidences where um, there's been excessive use of force and lethal force. So it's racially biased policing, right? It is often a crisis intervention failure, either because it was a lack of sufficient training or the training didn't do the job, right? Particularly where there are issues of mental health and disability with the person who was, who was uh, killed. And um, then of course, just excessive use of force. So these things keep showing up together in combination um, where, we, where we see um, a lethality at the hands of police. So in Seattle, as many of you probably know, there was back in, I guess, about 2011, so many incidences, one after another, um, really kind of culminated with the, uh, the, uh, the police shooting of uh, John T. Williams, the native carver, hard of hearing. He was asked to uh, put down his carving knife. He didn't do it. He was shot and killed. And so many of these things happened in rapid succession that uh, several civil rights organizations and community organizations, along with the ACLU, uh, put together a letter to the Department of Justice to have them come out and investigate the Seattle P Police Department. And that was at a time when the Department of Justice was kind of a resource for that, right? Because that's not the case now, right? They're very clear right now that they are not about uh, uh, intervening in police's lawful right to do what they do. So um, they came in, the uh, Seattle police were under a monitor uh, and a court process for uh, several years, which actually just in, I guess, about October of 2017 was reduced to compliance monitoring, so um, less attention to uh, what they're doing, but in sort of a maintenance phase. Like, so basically the decision, the, the finding was they have, they're substantially in compliance with all the things we want them to do. And in fact, there were changes that had happened with Seattle police. Um, there was a finding by the monitor that there's a reduction in use of force because the Department of Justice was clear there is excessive use of force with Seattle Police, but they found a reduction. They put a lot of things in place, and so I guess about April of 2017, the monitor said we're making a lot of progress, and at no expense to police. There's no harm that's happening in the community. But then, as you all know, in June of 2017 is when the police shot and killed Charlena Lyles, and it was such a, um, a painful moment, right? Because we see that notwithstanding all the things that have happened, this could still happen. A woman could call the police for help and in the presence of her children be shot and killed. And so this is where we know that, you know, as, as they've talked about, uh, police reform isn't so simple as changing a few rules, right? Um, so, Clearly, there is a need for massive culture change in policing, and it's been spoken to a little bit here so far, because uh, police, like all of us, are subject to structure, structural racism, right? That is absolutely present, um, and it's not something that changes overnight. When we look at uh, Philando Castile, which has, who, ha who was also mentioned earlier today, you know, he'd been pulled over um, uh, 31 times and hit with 63 traffic charges 
before that fatal encounter, and he actually had zero other criminal record apart from the traffic charges that happened because he was pulled over all, all the time, right? So it was a classic case of driving while black. It was nothing but that, right? And that ended up in the end of his life, and those police officers were not held accountable. And that's not unusual because the statistics in the record are pretty clear that um, uh, black, and brown, uh, black and brown people are disproportionately pulled over, and some of that is is implicit bias, and a lot of that is explicit bias, right? So here in Washington State, I just want to tell you a little bit about where we have gone with the numbers, right? So in 2015, there were 16 fatal police shootings. In 2016, so that was 2015. In 2016, there were 26 in Washington State, and then in 2017, 38. So that is a highly problematic rise, and so we're looking at this culture uh, where there's racially biased policing, we're looking at a culture of violence, uh, the militarization of policing, these things are on the rise. These fatalities represent the lives of someone, of people who were loved, right? They were loved by their families, they loved other people. It is just an absolute loss of humanity. Um, that's deeply painful. So one of the things that happened with regard to this move toward accountability and training is, and Katrina already referenced this, right? So many family members who have been impacted by police violence and community members came together and wrote Initiative 940, and that was a community-led effort to try to put some changes in place in Washington State. And the ACLU was proud to support and join that. And the legislature has passed it, um, but it's really only kind of a beginning step. But what I want to tell you is, the thing about Washington State was in our law, a police officer couldn't be held accountable unless there was a finding of malice. And that's really hard to do, because basically you got to have somebody say, I'm going to kill somebody right now, and then do it, right? Because apart from that, you're really not going to show that. Um, and so one of the key things that 940 did was take that language out of our law and change the standard so it's an objective, good faith standard that a reasonable officer in that situation would feel that there was a need for that level of force. It also um, put in place independent investigation, which is extremely uh, critical and increase the training. But that is, as I'm sure you've gathered from hearing all, from all these folks, really a beginning place, but it's an important place and that was the community that made that happen. So um, I will say that the legislature passed it. There is some litigation going on right now related to whether um, it's going to stand. You'll have to stay tuned for that. I'm not gonna go into all the legalities of it. Um, but uh, we hope that uh, it will, be upheld. If not, it'll be on the ballot and you'll hear about that because we're going to need you to vote um, to, to lift that up. I think the last thing I want to say just very quickly is that um, another thing that has happened and certainly we're that we have here in Seattle and King County is community oversight bodies. And so that's also a good start. It's not all of what we need it to be uh, just yet, probably in terms of how much power those bodies have. But in Seattle, uh, basically out of that uh, DOJ process, we got this uh, Seattle Community Police Commission. And in King County, there's the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. And those are professionally staffed entities that have community members who come together to play a role in oversight. And then because of the, um, uh, out of their work, we now have an addition, an office of, um, I don't know why I can't get this out of my mouth, the, a new office of the Inspector General. So there's a lot of those bodies in place um, to help with accountability, and we'll talk more about that because I'm sure there's plenty to, to question about how to make that really actually show up in an effective way uh, for people. Um, I was going to actually comment because I'd heard about the officer who, who says no one dies today, and I think that issue of sanctity of life, which arose out of uh, President Obama's commission, is really a big piece of the key. Right now we don't have that, right? We don't have that idea from all police officers that no one should die today, and that life is sacred and needs to be upheld, and that's the place that we have to get to. So I'll stop there. We have lots to talk about.